Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to episode 145 of Making It with me, your host, Terry Wallman. I really appreciate you joining us, and I encourage you to stay mindful and safe as we work together as a community to get through this global health pandemic. You can find all of our episodes on entertalkmedia.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or just go to terrywallman.com slash podcast. Also, please vote in our upcoming election. Every voice matters, including yours. And check out my YouTube channel to view the new video of Beautiful Sound of Us, which we created to empower and encourage everyone to vote. The song features Donald Weber Jr. from the Broadway cast of Hamilton, new artist Ray Jupiter, and a virtual choir of over 30 singers, including me and one of my guests on today's show. I'd like to share with you my intention that inspires this podcast. Time passes quickly, and I've learned that we should do what's in our hearts and do it well without apologies or excuses. I encourage you to create your life and art in your own unique way and express your artistry with joy and abandon. Be willing to work uncompromisingly for what you believe in. Success will have a better chance of finding you when you live your life with integrity, focus, and passion. Be selfish with your discipline and selfless in your performance. And don't forget to have fun along the way. My guests today are the perfect example of that. They are also husband and wife, actor Linda Griffin and musician Tom Griffin. Happy wife, proud mother, avid cook, lazy gardener, certified horticulturalist. As a musical actress, Linda Griffin was an original cast member of Broadway shows Something Rotten and The Drowsy Chaperone and can be heard on both Grammy-nominated cast albums. She performed the role of Mrs. Schroeder, narrator, in Anyone Can Whistle at New York City Center. She has also been featured in the Broadway tours of Wicked, A Chorus Line, 42nd Street, and Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Linda created the role of Propsy in the world premiere of Minsky's at the Amundsen Theater in L.A., and more recently, the Hollywood Bowl in Mel Brooks' The Producers. Tom Griffin is a nationally recognized music director and conductor. Recent productions include Oliver, Sweeney Todd, The Music Man, West Side Story, Bye Bye Birdie, the national tour of My Fair Lady, and Alabama Shakespeare Festival's production of Mary Poppins. He has been recognized for the Broadway revival of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and received the Garland Award and Los Angeles Drama Critics Award for Best Musical Direction. Tom was the music conductor of Disney's Beauty and the Beast on two national tours. Tom Griffin and Linda Griffin, welcome to Making It. Yay, thank you. Thanks for having us. It's uh, always great to see you, and we do see each other because we are, like everybody else, on Zoom right now. Zoom. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. But full disclosure, we are close friends. Mm -hmm. You went to college with my wife, Melanie. That's right. And I'm really happy to have you on the show. Yay! And I don't normally have more than one guest at a time. You are in the trilogy now. I started (laughs) with Alan and Marilyn Bergman the first time I did that. Fancy. More recently, the directors of Crip Camp, the documentary on Netflix uh, that was executive produced by the Obamas. Cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were in two different locations. And now you. So I'm kind of in new territory. But I really wanted to have both of you. And I've been thinking about doing it like this for a while because not only individually, but together as a team, you've created a really wonderful life. You know, a beautiful life, very creative and not just artistically, but personally. Thank you. Yes. I would agree mm-hmm. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, Linda, I'd like to begin our show with a quote that you recently posted by Neil Simon. And if you don't mind, I'd love for you to read it. Okay, doke. Don't listen to those who say you are taking too big a chance. Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine floor and it would surely be rubbed out by today. Most importantly, don't listen when the little voice of fear inside you rears its ugly head and says, they are all smarter than you out there. They're more talented, they're taller, blonder, prettier, luckier, and they have connections. 
I firmly believe that if you follow a path that interests you, not to the exclusion of love, sensitivity, and cooperation with others, but with the strength of conviction that you can move others by your own efforts and do not make success or failure the criteria by which you live, the chances are you'll be a person worthy of your own respects. Thanks for reading that. You got it. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw that uh, you put it up a couple of weeks ago on social media, Mm -hmm. and I was wondering what prompted you to do that. But also, I think your life is a great example of these words. So I do want to ask you, what prompted you, what inspired you to post this? Um, Well, I think it's just a really good uh, way to sort of set your intention for your creative life, um, because... Um, Neil Simon also had another quote that I, I had on my, our refrigerator for years and years. And it's just about what it takes. He was recognizing the bravery that it takes to be a creative person and the courage it takes to put yourself out there all the time. And he was talking really about the audition process and the process of just seeking representation, (laughs) trying to figure out the business and all of that. And I think I had posted that before several years ago. And then in, in just in, um, just during this time where our, our industry, you know, was the first to shut, you know, shut down and it will be the last to reopen. So we're kind of in a, in a real holding pattern. And so many of us are trying to figure out how do we, how do we go forward? You know, how do we, do we change our career? Do we shift? Do we, you know, do we do it all on zoom, you know? And I think it's just recognizing that it takes a lot of courage and bravery and um, to sort of reach out and do things that scare you, you know. Well, it's so very true. Uh, you know, our <laughs> our life seems to be cemented in, in courage and bravery. Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways it feels trite to hear that coming out of my mouth when I think of first responders and Mm-hmm. you know, our police force and our, our medical personnel and, and soldiers and things like that. But mm-hmm. but with no disrespect to any of that, it does take a tremendous amount of courage to be an artist and to choose that path. Mm-hmm. Tom, I would imagine you would agree. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, you have, during this time, it's it's a struggle. You have to, you know, stay focused and, um try to keep your art going. And, uh, but on the other hand, you've got to think about basic things. It ha- it's created a real focus on the basic things of life, your, your safety, your home, your loved ones and your health. Um, and then you have to look at a very long uh, window. There's a long window you have to look at uh, because we don't anticipate work for quite some time. So you have to look at survival. It's really survival till the window opens back up. And then it's beyond that because it's going to take a little while for things to start up again. So it's an interesting time. It's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's for sure. Before we go deeper into that, and I intend okay. to. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> I want to read something about you that was a description of you on, I believe it might have been Wikipedia or your bio, just so people can know a little bit more about you. You've been described as experienced musical director with a demonstrated history of working in the music industry, skilled in music technology, musical theater, piano, Broadway, and live events, strong arts and design professional with a postgraduate work focused in film scoring from University of California. How would you describe yourself? (laughs) Oh, gosh. Oh, that's tough. Uh, Oh, well... I have a lot of interests. So uh, music is just a part of my interests. I I tend to be a homebody. I find myself being a homebody more and more. Uh, But, you know, a a lot of times I have to go away to do work. But I I, I always, I I gravitate right back to home. So uh, we have a good life at home. Yeah, you do. Yeah, so... Uh, that's a fortunate thing, I think, for uh, people in the industry. Um, The industry is is pretty tough, you know, Uh, not only finding work, but, uh, you know, you're gone. Oftentimes you have to go places or tour or, you know, 
And as you get older, it's a little harder. So how would I describe myself? I, you know, I'm kind of a homebody. I, yeah. I tend to work. I like having, I, I like the aspect of, of having different projects that change all the time. I, I really like that. Um, a lot of people don't. I, I do. I like the, the challenge of something new. And a, a, so, uh, but that takes a lot of time in your life to get used to. I think that's mm-hmm. just an, I think that's an experience you learn over time. Um, and you get less anxious about that idea that something's new. You still have those, what I call first day of school feelings. You know what I mean? Cause every show is like that. You have that first day you're going to go in and start with a new set of people. So, um, but I'd say, um, you know, I, during this time, it's been interesting because we've really focused in on our home and catching up with all these things that we didn't have the time before to do. Or, or you know, in the rush of going to jobs or a show, or you, you put aside all these things, so you have that long list of to-dos, you know. So now we've actually done a lot of our to-dos. So we're, we're down to organizing screws and nails now. Yeah. Wow. Boy, well, you are, you're you're ahead of the current situation at our house. <laughs> yeah. Well, I said to Linda the other day, I said, one of the things I just hate, I've had, it's been for years, I had five or six locations of uh, screws and bolts, bolts and, and nuts and, 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 <laughs> and I said, I'm so sick of having it in five or six different places so that when I have to fix something, I want to go to one little box or, or a series of little boxes. So I ordered these little organizer boxes and we, and I asked her to help me because I knew she would. I'm bored. So I, I, I was happy to help. <laughs> so all of a sudden we're, we have these little boxes you could look through and go, Oh, there's exactly what, it, you know, right. that's great. That's extremely it productive. Only t- it only took four, <laughs> 40 some odd years. And the global pandemic. Yes, yeah. The global <laughs> plan- pandemic. Well, you know, we, we're, we're out of a, out of work a lot, you know, our, our whole career spanning, you know, 35 to 40 years. Um, you know, there's several years of unemployment mixed throughout all of that, you know? Um, so we're kind of used to entertaining ourselves at home and finding things to do. Um, this is so unique in that it's just gone on for so long, you know, usually we're either auditioning by now or we're, you know, looking for work or we're audition, you know, I mean, uh, rehearsing or, you know, looking forward to the next job. So, um, what Tom is saying about that long-term sort of vision. Um, and we don't know, we don't know what that, there's no end date, you know? So, right. you know, it's like, what do we do now? <laughs> you know? But yeah. This is nothing new for either one of you in, in the fact that like you don't generally waste your time between jobs and between looking for jobs. Mm-hmm. Linda, you, you know, you went out and learned horticulture, mm-hmm. really learned it. You're yeah, not a yeah. hobbyist. I mean, you, you became right. an expert at that. Tom, you, you have a patent that you develop oh, on yeah. a product. I mean, there's a list of things that you do. Even Linda, currently, you are doing virtual tours of right, the city right. of Los Angeles. Yeah. Figuring out what to do with the time. We just did this video together to right. get people to vote. It's kind of, in a way, not out of the norm, but it is a very surreal, very surreal time. Tom, I wanted to ask you, You both met when you were 16 and Linda was 15 in the course of Cinderella. You went to the same college and you got married when you were 20 years old. How's that working out for you so far? Great. (laughs) Great. It's not, I mean, I look at, I would tell young people, I, I look back at that and it's worked out, but, um, I would probably tell a young person now, don't do that. (laughs) <laughs> uh, not because it didn't work out for us and it, not that it couldn't work out for them, but, uh, you know, young people now are more apt to have a longer uh, courtship, I think. I, although we were together for four years, so before we got married. But um, I, I, younger young people now, they tend to court a little longer. They're not in a big rush to get married. Sometimes they don't get married till they're 30. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't think that's or a beyond, bad thing. Yeah. Or beyond. They're having kids later, you know. So. Linda, do you feel like you hit the, won the lotto in your relationship? <laughs> because I mean, it is kind of mm-hmm. rare. It's it is rare. rare. Yeah. 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 
Well, you know, both of us are very easygoing people um, and we're not, you know, we love, our ambition isn't um, singular. You know, we're not ambitious for Mm -hmm. ourselves. We're ambitious for our unit. So I think that was a big, that's a very big difference um, I see in a lot of uh, young couples where finding that is more difficult and it takes time you know, where you kind of let go of my singular ambition. Um, and maybe you do, and maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, but that's something unique, I think, to us that we both, we, we love to, we love the work, we love to be busy, we love to be productive, but we're not seeking fame, we're not seeking fortune, we're seeking, we're seeking a collaboration and a creative process. And a good life. Yeah, yeah. And a balance in that life, mm-hmm. you know. Um, oh, we see that a lot. That that's a good point. Uh, the balance is a big is a really good point because yeah. usually the balance is what throws people's relationships off. Well, how do you balance life and work? We enjoy our time together. <laughs> well, I I what I tell people when I get that question is I um, because you know working out of away from Tom and away from home is you know is is always the case. And I, and I just say, um, be where your feet are. So I see people like, how do you do it? You know, that, and then they're in their second week of being away from home. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you, you've got a year ahead of you on this road. You better, <laughs> you better figure it out. But I just say, be where your feet are. So enjoy your life wherever you are placed at the moment. So, you know, when I'm out on tour or I'm, you know, on, on a location away from home, then I seek out adventure there and I seek out friendships there and relationships that I can, um, you know, I can nurture. And of course, Tom and I stay in contact and he comes out and visits or, you know, I have some time off, but I don't pine. Like when I'm at home, I'm not pining for Broadway or for, you know, I'm, I'm busy at home and I'm happy at home and I seek adventure at home. And, and the opposite is true when I'm working. So well, she, um, every time she's gotten a major job offer, she always asks me, you know, she always comes to me and says, um, you know, I'm getting this offer to, to thinking about doing this thing. And, and it, it's been every single time. And every single time I've always said, well, it's, it's always the same thing. I always say, well, do you want to do it? And then the second thing I say, well, you have to do this. You know, you can't not do this. <laughs> right. And so it's like, I, but I, wa- I want to make sure that that's something she wants to do as opposed to feels she's obligated to do it. And there's been times when she'll say, uh, you know, I've got this audition or something and, <clears throat> and I'll actually say to her, uh, you don't want to do that. I should <laughs> say that. You you don't want to go. She goes, oh, thank God you said that. You know, because sometimes it's financial. She's thinking, oh, I got to do this so that I can contribute and I'm going to do this. And sometimes I'm like, don't bother to do that. You don't want to do that. You're going to be miserable. You, Yeah. She's like, oh, thank, thank you for saying that. I didn't want to do it anyway. So... There's figure that, it out. This part of your partnership, not just your marriage, but your the collaboration that you have between the two of you, was I probably founded in you starting your first company, your production company when you got out mm-hmm. of college, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. started out with a bang and ended with a whimper. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly opened another door for you, Linda. Yeah. Could you share that story of, you know, going from you know, balls out, we're going to do this, we're out of college, we're producing shows together, to bankruptcy, to then getting an audition that actually changed your career? Yeah, well, we, you know, Tom and I were so young when we when we were doing all of that. We were in our early, early 20s when we got the opportunity to start um, a cabaret theater in L.A. And, um, and you know, that was the beginning of our production company. Um, and, you know, we were working with a restaurant, uh, that, that hired us to produce a show within the restaurant. So it was a cast of actors and singers and dancers who also were waiting on the tables and, and it was incredible. And and we opened with a, with incredible reviews and just excitement and all of that. And, um, you know, in our, own naivete, I think, uh, we always expected everyone to work the way we did. 
and to um, invest the same amount of time and the same amount of energy and um, and they don't <laughs> you know? and because of that it sort of it it did really well at first and then it just kind of kept shifting and the restaurant wasn't really reinvesting in advertisement and all of that and it was it was just a bad location I think overall and it sort of you know um, Kind of they eventually out. sold the location, and they sold they the location out, out from under us. You know, and we we just kept trying to adapt and change and keep the entertainment going. And in the meanwhile, we we started doing industrials. This is the '80s, right? When all the business industrials were happening, and so we started doing that, which was really fun. And you know, went to New York for the first time, took Melanie with us, and um, and did you know some industrials in New York and across the country and here in LA, and we were kind of doing that for a while. And then just all these things are sort of random. We we're very big on just saying, yes, we're not so big on setting goals and intent, you know, like this is our big goal, you know? <laughs> so we, we just kept saying yes to these opportunities. And, um, one, one day we were, I'm kind of skipping forward, but to the starlight here in Burbank is a big, beautiful outdoor amphitheater. And while we were sort of doing all of the industrials and things like that. Tom and I took this um, walk up up there in the hills and saw this theater and we were, what is this beautiful place? And it reminded us of a theater that we grew up with in San Bernardino. That was an outdoor bowl. Also, we thought, oh, we could produce things here. We could kind of really go back to what's in our heart, which is creating musical theater and going back to that that business you want to take it from there you talk to me yeah. yeah so uh we i started looking into what was going on uh it, it was a city-owned facility uh 6800 seats so it's it's very similar to the greek in size the greek theater uh the difference was there's a uh it, anyway it's it, it's about the size of the greek and we found out that the city, in fact, was open to new, uh, they were just looking into new operations there. They had had Jackson Brown there, and that had been the last concert. It got canceled, actually, and they got sued over it because uh, there was this, they closed it because of some politics over the, the gr- there was more grass on the grass than there was, you know, it was that kind of a thing that was being said. There was more grass up there on the grass, you know, and so uh, they actually got sued by uh, and later lost that lawsuit, in mm-hmm. fact. It took many years, but anyway. So they were looking for new management and we stepped in and knew, said the right things, surrounded ourselves with good people. Uh, we knew we couldn't do it alone. We found a financial backer that later turned out to be a crook. And uh, anyway, we we did open the amphitheater. Uh, it was a struggle, but uh, because the money that was promised never showed up, uh, uh, it was a big lesson. We had top attorneys and top people and Ticketmaster and all this stuff. I mean, it was we, huge. We changed we, the... Uh, we opened with new logo, new, you know, we, we, us and our and family members and friends hand painted the entire seating area. It was a very <laughs> grassroots, you know, um, but very professional um, operation. Yeah. And then when we opened with Weird Al Yankovic and Dr. Demento and Howie Mandel, um, you know, we sold out and the concert was fantastic. And, and the summer continued that way. We were selling out what we were doing and, and it was awesome. There's Evelyn Champagne King and the Barquets and the Gap Band. And, yeah. Uh, we did a oof, we did a heavy metal night. I didn't <laughs> want to go into that. That was crazy. But anyway, we we were trying to move forward and the uh, the finances fell out. And because the gentleman that was promising it had never really intended to yeah. come through with it. It was just a it was a ploy. He had, he had scammed, I found out later, we'd done a check on it, but he had scammed some banks. Mm. So you have to put it in perspective. Do you remember the 80s and the savings and loan scams? He was involved in that. So um, we we just got shafted by somebody who was doing it on a bigger scale and didn't realize it. And Anyway, in that industry, you don't want to let 
anyone think think you're financially in bad shape. So we were trying to replace the money, and mm. anyway, it mm-hmm. ended, it ended up it ended up in a, ba- a corporate bankruptcy, and we tried to reorganize. The city was wonderful. They actually renewed our contract while we were in the middle of reorganizing, uh, but they just couldn't go on uh, any longer. And we knew we needed to release the contract. The what, what the irony of it all was we wanted to get the city to help us. We said, well, why don't you allow us to manage it? You could be the you could help us get the money. You know, you're a city, and at the time is too politically hot. Uh, now you fast forward, they were never able to get anybody up there after we did it, and they eventually took it over again. Years they later. sort of modeled their whole operation they, a little bit like. Oh, after everything we did. Yeah. L- Linda had designed a whole 4th of July celebration. That was one of the things. We, we wanted to do the commercial things, but we also wanted the commercial things to sponsor artistic you know, local groups, the symphony, uh, children's theater. We were hoping the financial from those uh, pop concerts and rock concerts, the, some of that money could be filtered over and support other things, you know, the stuff that we really wanted to help produce. So Linda had the well, let idea. Me get, let me get back to, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but let me get back to really what I'm the most curious about is, <laughs> is how did you – pull yourself up and brush oh. your brush yourself off from the devastation of that and f- find your next music job. And, and Linda, you specifically, how did that lead to you being in the first dinner theater production of a chorus line, yeah. which led to you getting your equity card? And mm-hmm. how did you transition from that? Well, I mean, just necessity. We, we were both, you know, we had lost all this, all the, we had lost the income opportunity and we both sat there and Tom started temping and I started temping and, and you just do what you have to do to get, get food on the table and, and, and work, you know, we're still as many guests on this show, you know, I'm I'm always fascinated. I mean, a certain amount of guests have only just done acting Mm -hmm. or music or whatever, but so many, including myself have done other things along the way when we need to, to keep it going. Right. And not only is there no shame in that, you know, I admire that in people. Um, you know, it's got a cute little name now called Side Hustle. Or, and now it's, trans- <laughs> yeah. and now it's yeah. transitioned into survival for everybody. Right, right. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we just like to be busy. So and right. we don't have ego involved with those kinds of things. We, we have all these other skills, so why not use them, you know? Right. And then I just saw that there was an audition and I was a non-union. I, I mean, I'd been producing. I hadn't been auditioning. So I just randomly saw this thing and went, oh, that's a chorus line was my, you know, favorite show from mm-hmm. when I was a kid watching theater and wanting to do that. And somehow they hired me. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, not and, only did uh, they hire you, but they actually said to you, where the heck have you been? Yeah, and and yeah. your response was off on other adventures. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I was mm-hmm. 26, 27, mm-hmm. and everybody else in the company, too, was that age. And they, they'd never seen me at auditions and hadn't seen me in the local theater. And they're like, what? Where has this person been? So the director at the time said to me, I, I'm going to make this happened for you. You're going to get your equity card out of this show. So one way or the other, I'm going to make it happen because you should be, you should be working mm-hmm. in the, in the, you know, industry as a pro. So he did. Would you say that's a rarity? Do you see a lot of that kind of generosity in people in your industry? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, at the, back then, I think, yes. Now, I think it's so different because the industry has changed so much with all of the different um, colleges and universities and musical theater programs. It's become a little more of a machine, you know, where they're releasing these really just their talent is off the charts, you know. Um, and so it's, I think that your personal connection will never be unimportant that will always be the most important thing that people will recognize that and want to work with you again um but yeah i think musical theater is different that way i think it's a very generous industry don't you tom don't you think 
it's all it's all personal connections. Yeah. I, at, least in the, at least in musical theater, for for the music directors especially. Mm-hmm. Particularly, it's mostly producers, but sometimes directors are both artistic directors. So you have personal relationships with them, and they keep calling you, mm-hmm. and that's tricky. I mean, it's because- such a collaborative art form. You know, you're collaborating with your fellow actors, you're collaborating mm-hmm. with the director, with the, with the design, you know, the costume designers and the choreographer. I mean, you know, this, everything is so collaborative in that, in, in our, in our world. So you have to be generous with your time that way. Since yeah. you're both referring to college and how the preparation that you both had is a little bit different than what it is now, what lesson from college do you think most prepared you for your career and what lesson do you wish you had learned before beginning your career? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to take a second. <laughs> well, uh, a lot of, <laughs> mine, mine's tricky because I had uh, uh, my parents split up right before I was getting ready to go to college. So uh, there was a lot of turmoil. And uh, then I, so I had a financial consideration. I think you also had similar things as I remember. I did. Yes. And so finances were kind of part of it. Uh, um, And then that went into where to choose what school to go to. Uh, I ended up at Cal State Fullerton, which was a lovely school, but they basically teach um, classical. It's a classical based approach, both singing wise at least in the music department, uh, singing and or music wise, instrumentally. So I wanted to do commercial music and nobody had commercial. Very few schools had any kind of commercial side. Uh, and they just started it while I was there. I had to kind of seek that out a little bit at UCLA, uh, in some night school classes later. And, uh, I think that the college helped around me as an individual and also helps to ground you a little bit because you're moving away from home and you got to figure out how to live your life and uh, be away. And at the time I was dating Linda, so I would drive home on the weekends. She was still home in where we lived. And uh, then she joined at the same school in the theater department. So we were at least close to each other and that helped for us to be able to see each other. And then I was active in the theater department too. So I ended up getting to my senior year and we decided to go ahead and get engaged and get married. We decided not to actually wait, uh, much to my mom's chagrin. Um, I, I only had was afraid it was going to be the end of everything. (laughs) Yeah. She, she just didn't want, she, she's not with us anymore, but, uh, she didn't want me to quit school by, I had sick, I had one semester left and she thought that might disrupt things. And our feeling was we weren't, we never lived together. It was back in those days. We decided we just didn't, you didn't do that. And, or generally you didn't, few people did. So we decided uh, we wanted to be married and then we could move in. We decided we didn't want to have other roommates anymore. And I proposed and she said, yes, of course. And I asked her dad and we decided that in the fall we would be living um, as a married couple and that I would just finish my last semester. Back to the original question though. Yeah. What, yes. which, well, cause I know I love, I mean, I'm fascinated by the story of your relationship, which is why I wanted to have you on the show together. But is there one major takeaway lesson that you learned from college and one that was severely missing that would have been helpful? I hate to sound, I don't want to be negative, but My college experience was a good college experience, but I would say there was probably on one hand the number of teachers that I would call remarkably uh, inspirational. They truly loved what they did. They truly inspired you. And then the rest was more of a general discipline you learned Mm -hmm. (laughs) how to go through the steps to get from this point to this point with that goal in mind, which was a bachelor's degree. And I had, I had a limited time. I'm just speaking for myself. I had a very, I had a limited amount of time, a limited amount of money. So what, and music in the, and here's the frustrating thing about music. If you want to go in contemporary music, you don't need a, you don't need a degree. No one, if you go into the studios, they don't really ask you, What's your degree? What they say is, 
show us what you could do, or let me hear you play. Uh, you could come right out of junior high, and if you're a phenomenal guitarist, they're not going to care. They're not going to care you, you, if you're doing the skill already. Now, it's unusual. I think college teaches you discipline. I, I learned a lot about discipline and practicing and working on you know things, and I did learn a lot of technique during that time, and of course, I enjoyed being in the theater department, which was... Right, because you were studying acting and dancing as well. You really yes, got a very and, well-rounded and uh, And I ended, up in, I ended up in live the- musical theater, so that's a, a skill that's useful to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Linda, Linda, I'm sure, has some points on this too, so go ahead. Well, Linda? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the main thing that I really appreciate about my college time was just the exploration of all the different... Mm -hmm. genres that I was able to do. I did opera, I did dance, I did acting, I did musical theater. And I don't think that exists anymore. They're so focused on Mm -hmm. one, you know, um, path. So um, I think what I took away from that too was that uh, sort of adventurous spirit as to, you know, what do you want me to do now? You know, not not like I'm an actor and I don't dance. <laughs> you know, there's so many people like that. Like, well, I, I you know, I didn't learn to dance because I didn't want to be in the in the chorus. You know, or... well, it's funny she'd say this because I used to go in, I'd see the sign on the wall in the theater department. I'm a music major, and I'd see that they're having an audition for this one act play. It's not on the main stage; it's just a little one act in their black box. And I'd go, well, I'm going to go in and audition for this this acting part. I did I did a bunch of act. I did a bunch of regular straight plays while I was there and they don't allow you to do that anymore right. because they, they hold, they, they have so many students that are packed in there and they say, okay, we got this many roles and we're going to only allow the juniors and seniors yeah. to take on roles. So for your freshman and sophomore years, you're not even allowed to do that. I, we did it the whole time. You went in, if you could yeah. if you were good enough, you got the role. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think that's where a lot of the so-called what they, you know, a lot of people are labeled now as being very entitled. Well, they've been trained to be that way. You know, it's not really their fault. It's like their expectations are different, you know. So it's um I think they expect that if they do step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4, then I'm all the rest of it's supposed to all <laughs> the rest is supposed to just happen. And that's not how it works, you know. I yeah. wish that we had gotten a lot more education as to the business of the industry. Mm-hmm. Me too. You know? Me too. And I think they do a better job of that now. Mm-hmm. They don't. Um, but back then they were like, you know, people left college uh, for your degree and had no clue how to get a job, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, well, or the <laughs> different, many different things that were out there uh, to do. Right. All the different aspects of theater that were there to do, you know, so that, that I think that would have been a better in our school at Berkeley, we did have music business courses and, you know, they did actually a good job at that, although mm-hmm. uh, it was not as complete as would have been helpful um, yeah. in hindsight. However, <laughs> one of the things that they did regarding preparing us for being out of college, it was on the first day of orientation. They said, look around right now, look around, look to your left, look to your right. 80% of you are not going to make it through this program. Mm-hmm. I don't remember yeah. the percentages, but they were maybe right. it was 50%. 50% of you are, are either not going to finish because you either can't hack it or you're going to get scooped up from a major artist and you're going to go mm-hmm. off and start your career. The rest of you are going to end up having day jobs and not being able to make it as a musician mm-hmm. in the music industry. And a few of you are going to be friends for life and you are going to be working together in your success. So the odds are against you. Yeah, that that yeah, was yeah. our, you know, that was our big music business lesson in orientation. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, for a moment thought about getting in my Honda station wagon and driving back to Miami, you know, with my yeah. juicer and my guitar. And, <laughs> Give it you know, up now, right? Yeah. It's get, funny. get there first. <laughs> it's but it was helpful to that. hear that. It was yeah, good to yeah. hear that. Yeah. Well, well, it gives you a sense of just really determination. I just say tenacity is your number one skill that you should have. Right. You know? Agreed. Absolutely. I actually tell I tell kids that all the time. I'll say they'll say I want to do this. I want to do what you're doing, and I'll say you need to be tenacious. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you're going to hear you're going to hear people along the way. They're going to tell you that you're not going to make it, mm-hmm. and if you're 
if you believe it enough and you stick with it and you push and you work and you have talent and you'll, you'll make it, mm -hmm. but it's going to be, a, and you may have to have a second or a third job or teach or all these other things. And Tenacity is one of my favorite words. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you both on that. <laughs> Let's jump around a little bit right now. You both love good food. Yes. Which mm -hmm. one of you is a better cook? She is. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Tom does very well if you tell him exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, the difference is he'll open the refrigerator and he'll see nothing. And then he'll just close the refrigerator. <laughs> you see opportunity. <laughs> and I see opportunity in everything. Um, so I'm, I'm much more uh, comfortable without a recipe. Right. But he's very, he will do a very good job if you give him all of the tools and the recipe and he'll, he'll do a very good job because he's, mm -hmm. yeah. he likes, he likes that, like the, the, you know, hands-on kinds of stuff. But definitely I do 99% of the cooking at home. I told her years ago <laughs> that she could serve me anything and I will never complain because if she's willing to take the risk of making a choice and doing the work and you're never going to hear a complaint from me. And so the, so we have worked out over the years, this relationship where she does all the cooking for pretty much. And then I do all the cleaning in the kitchen. Yeah. That's, that seems reasonable. She can make a mess. I'll clean it up. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> As any good chef. Yeah. If there's not sauce on the ceiling. Yeah. I, I think and, I get a, I have a better deal out of this. Actually. Yeah. I think, I think learning how to cook and enjoying cooking is the biggest gift you can give yourself mm -hmm. because that's a huge joy of life is experiencing all these different foods, you know, mm -hmm. we, and especially here in LA and California, I mean, we have so much fresh food available to us and we have all of these different cultures that we can experience. So um, I, I just say, man, man, if you, if you can find a way to learn how to cook, you're going to have a much happier life. Mm -hmm. You know, I agree on that. You both have been talking about, well, not so much a creative process, which I want to ask you about collaboration. There are, are parallels of course, in both. You've both have had the opportunity to develop shows to be in on the ground floor, uh, you know, Linda, you've created roles in certain productions and, and roles have been written for you. Tom, you've been ground floor uh, on collaborating with people. I guess the, a simple question is, uh, it's not simple. We could go on for a day on this, but <laughs> yeah. to each of you, how would you describe your creative process in what you do? Tom creating, writing a piece of music, Linda creating a, a character for a show. How, wh what's your creative process and and then also a little bit about the art of collaboration, what the true essence of collaboration means to each of you. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, getting, getting the, the structure of whatever the world is, you know, like for instance, um, uh, and, and for me, most of, most of my recent work has been within an ensemble of people. So it's not been a starring role or something where everything's written in the script and then you have a lot more, information available to you so my joy is is getting nothing in the script and you're you know you're just a, you're in the ensemble of something and then de really developing a background and a world and an and a identity for that person so that it becomes um fun and exciting for somebody else to watch it's not just somebody is a member of a line but that's a real person up there who's really creating you know a a scene or, or being part of that world. Um, and it's just, for me, it's improvisational. I mean, you know, you take the information you're given and then you play around and then you find things that work and things that get a, the response that you're looking for. And um, so, especially in that type of position within the ensemble, you can't make a mistake, you know, because, you know, you're not going off the page. You're, building the page. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the director might say, Ooh, no, we <laughs> will <You know? laughs> go, Oh my God, what are you doing? It's awesome. You know? So you just have to let, mm -hmm. let the fear of making a mistake, just get rid of that and just start making choices and just having fun with it. And that, mm -hmm. that, that to me is, is really fun. Yeah. Beautifully be said. To do that. Yeah. 
Tom? I, I was, she started to say it when she was saying you, you create, you look at the bigger world. Uh, like if I'm, if I'm working on a musical, for example, you look at the big world first and then you work your way down into the details of it. And the details are, can, are really, you, you really dig into the, the minor details of it. So, and that's everything. And, and when you're doing a musical, for example, you're dealing with choreographer, you're dealing with a director, you're dealing with casting. Casting is really tricky. And, uh, uh, and there's all the, there's the nuances of casting and the politics of casting, which is tricky. Uh, uh, I tend to do, I do a lot of shows up at Utah at the pioneer. And so we'll go to New York and we'll do casting and, and, you know, we're all sitting at that table and there's, Three major people, well, actually four. There's a choreographer, a director, music director, and a casting director. Mm -hmm. So there's all these people pulling a little bit. It's probably no different than when you're dealing with a film, for example. If you're doing with a film and you're trying to cast the actors in a film, and there's the casting director, and there's agents, and there's managers, and there's producers, and with their little fingers in it. You know what I mean? Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you start with the big details. You kind of try to agree upon what those parameters are and you work yourself down to the smaller details. Um, you know, I've worked a lot with um, Casey Nicola, who's just an incredible director. And the best mm. thing he does is he sets the style. Like what is the style of this piece going to look like, especially when he's developing a new, a new uh, musical, you know, um, and then once you have that, that's what Tom's talking about, like the big picture of that, then you mm -hmm. work within that style. It Whereas some, di some directors I've worked with, they wait and put the style much later. And I think that makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, it affects it because the style will affect your casting. Yeah. The kind of singer, the kind of artist, the kind of musician. I mean, the style of the music, your musicians, we know this, where Yes, there are some that can play all kinds, but let's face it, everybody specializes a little bit. So you've got your jazz player, you've got your rock player, you've got your country player, you've got, uh, you know, and everybody's a little better at certain things. And mm -hmm. so if you're trying to work in a certain style, you're going to want the best in that area. Tom, uh, I'll start with you. Is there a defining moment that happened in your career that you kind of felt like, okay, here we go? I'm doing this. I'm doing what I trained for, what I dreamt to do. There's been a couple. I think when I was young, the I got I got cast as the pianist for a national tour of the Young Americans. And at that time, it was it's not the Young Americans of now. Mm -hmm. It was the Young Americans where they used to do things called Columbia Artist Tours. They do three to six months out on the road, and they did their national tours. And they'd be in a bus. It was a bus and truck. And they had a big truck, and we'd go from town to town. I was 16, mm. and I went for three months, actually left school. Um, my, I had good grades. I was So the uh, teachers let me go for three months. Anyway, that would be the first thing. I think that really affected me because I then thought, I, I really am a good, I'm good at this. I'm really, and confidence for playing and as a pianist. Uh, and then I'd say the second time, probably the national tour of Beauty and the Beast when I was conducting those orchestras, because that was a 19 piece orchestra. Must that was amazing. Second mm -hmm. national, that was actually the first truly tour. It was a big national tour. The very first time out, big cities, big professional orchestras, and I conducted, and uh, I was, I was good. I just knew I was good at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I could tell. And also, the musicians tell you, they you, it, they tell you in so many ways. Because mm -hmm. I would go up, and then they would go, "Wow, oh, you're really good." You know, they say things to you, and and they're just the way they would respond. So that's when I knew. They yeah. wouldn't roll your eyes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how many orchestras have you been? I've been in orchestras where I'm playing and the poor soul is told to go up there and conduct. They're the associate or the conductor. And mm -hmm. you just, I mean, the musicians are all talking in the pit and saying, 
just don't look, just don't look, just, right. just, we know what we're doing. Just everybody, the, the drummer's on, the bass player's on, just listen to them, stay with them. We'll be fine. We can hear the singers. We know where it's supposed to be, you know, and poor soul up there. I don't know what he's doing with his arms, but. Or That's how the or, Boston pops got through with Arthur Fiedler conducting. God oh, bless him. But yeah. I mean, that's what they used to tell me too when I was living in Boston. Oh man. Yeah. Cause I was learning about conducting. I said, I don't understand what, Exactly, I'm saying, and they they go. We don't really follow him. We all know the music, and we're all kind of a collective. <laughs> yeah, you. They agree amongst themselves. Yeah. They do. They agree yeah. amongst themselves. We got to get through this, and so here's our core. Everybody, this is who yeah. you're listening for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Linda, what about you? Obviously, being in the ground floor of the chorus line when you got your equity card, but yeah. defining moments for you, things that you yeah. kind of went, um, yes. I've had so many because going in and out of the business and, and stuff, um, you know, where you, you, you mark a different moment, you know, that mm-hmm. getting your equity card is a big milestone. And then when I actually got a national tour of a chorus line with Donna McKechnie, who was the original Cassie, and then I felt like, okay, now I'm, I'm bona fide, you know, because I'm on the line with her. Somebody who I had seen at the Sh- Schubert back in 1977 or whatever, you know, and went, oh, I, that's, <laughs> they're telling my story, you know. Um, and then my first Broadway show came so much later because, um, you know, we we had been in New York. We had our son in New York and then we moved back to California to be closer to family, to raise him, you know, here. And um, and that's when I did the horticulture and went to UCLA and got that certification and and had been away from the business for about six years Um raising max and during that time were you were you still keeping up on your discipline of of vocalizing or practicing no no no, not really i mean i was i was so busy with just being a mom and and doing this uh you know working in the field and and all of that and then i got a phone call from um i mentioned casey before he was in new york we had made plans for dinner and um, he was coming out for auditions for this new show that he was doing. And um, he goes, oh, my gosh, you're just I just think you're perfect for the show. Why don't you why don't you come in? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like I didn't even have a current picture. My resume was out of date. I had nothing to wear. I was just, you know, and Tom and Max were awesome. because so They were like, well, you have to go. Mm-hmm. You have to at least go and see what happens, you know. So you know, getting that Broadway debut so many years into, I mean, I was 45. Was I 45? Yeah. Something like that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and just experiencing it with all those beautiful people. And that's wonderful. Everybody, even it was their 10th Broadway show, that experience with the drowsy chaperone, everybody said it was like, this this doesn't get any better than this. So I was really lucky to have that. And that so that was you know, I think every every time you get a new job, it feels like you're getting validated and you're <clears throat> it starts all over again with the excitement Absolutely. and you know. I want to start to lead to my closing questions for both of you, um, but before we get there, Linda, I'll start with you. What lessons about art and about life have you learned on your journey, and what what has changed about your perspective in life as you've gotten older? Ooh, um. The lessons I've learned, I think really the most important one is to be available, um, to say yes and be available, to be open to something new, something scary, something that maybe you don't, um, you haven't, you you may not know that you have the skill set to be successful in that, um, you know, just to be curious. Mm-hmm. You know, never let that go. Um, what was the second part? What's changed about your perspective as you've gotten older? Oh, I think so or much. Or has it just gotten stronger in your belief? I think, I think a lot of it has gotten stronger, but I definitely don't need to, um, like my persona in terms of my, you know, everything is so dramatic when you're young. 
<laughs> you know, it's like you have such a greater, bigger picture about what's important in life once you get up to this point. And you realize that all the little nitty gritty, stupid little things people fuss over and worry about are just not worth the energy, you know, just let it, let it ride, you know, don't, it's all about, I think for me, happiness, so much of it is just about expectations and letting your expectations sort of minimize, you know, and then you're going to be okay. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. I understand that. Yeah. Tom? I think you uh, pick your projects more based upon the enjoyment level Mm -hmm. and the people you want to be with. So Mm -hmm. if you can control some aspects of that, in other words, you're more apt to pick people or to be around you that you can have a good time with Mm -hmm. because you realize the experience is everything. It's, mm. it's a, if you're going to have a miserable experience doing something, you, then it's not worth doing at all. Yeah. Whereas when you when you're younger, you'll jump into anything. You'll just say, "Oh, oh, I got that job. I'll go do that job." Then you realize you, it's it's like a horrible experience. You go, <laughs> you no, I mean, I can name jobs where I played piano, and I'm like, I it's a dingy, stinking, terrible bar or whatever, and there's nothing fun about it, and nothing, you know. You don't come away going, I got to do that again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no. So as you get older, you pick experiences that you know are going to enhance the rest of your life. If not, or at least you try. Yeah. And, uh, and, and one thing I will say, we both, <clears throat> and Tom, Tom has been very instrumental in this, is keeping your life small enough to manage it to where you can make choices like that. She's talking financially. Like financially <laughs> small enough. Right, like, right, you right. know, keep, keep, keep it as small as, as possible and happy, you know, to be comfortable. But, you know, you don't need the fancy car and the big, big house. You know, you, then you can have the opportunity <clears throat> to say no, maybe to that dingy bar. <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I mean, um, that's I mean, really been, I think, good for us. That's I great advice. Mm-hmm. I think it's also good to learn to say no. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got a I got a call recently from a, a trombone friend who was contracting a show and here in the valley, and then it was tied to that. I was I wasn't going to be the music director. I was going to be like the second keyboard assistant to somebody I had never worked with who had some TV credits. And but the the little carrot they threw out there was oh, and they're going to record the the cast album at Capitol Records. Well, who's not going to do that, right? I you know that would be cool. But I, the smell tested me. To me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I started to go, okay, something's not smelling right. And I very quickly bailed out of it because mm-hmm. all these, that little, I, that comes with experience. Because 40 years earlier, when you're younger and you hear all that, you're like, ah, capital, you know, I got to do it. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I got to be in the room where it happened. Yeah. Uh, now <laughs> you're like, this doesn't meet the smell test. Something's right. not. Something. And you know, I don't think they ever did it. I don't think that ever happened. Uh, I'm sure it was going to be way more work for me than it was for the person who was in charge. I was going to sure. probably do all their work for You'd them. be doing the heavy lifting. All the heavy one. lifting. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, uh, what do I no. do? I, I'm like, this is a no. <laughs> this is an easy no. I think it was my second album. I called it Say Yes. For the reasons that we're yeah. that we're talking about, because we did, we were open to anything for walking in through a side door or a back door of an opportunity mm-hmm. that grew into a TV show or a national tour. Mm-hmm. That was the right thing to say. But you know, I might be writing a song soon called "No Thank You," yeah. <laughs> "No Thanks." <laughs> I my mine is um, "No" is a complete answer. Yeah, like yes. we so often we're forced to justify our no, but you know what? Just say no. You know, right. sometimes, you justify sometimes, it. sometimes it's the right answer. Sometimes yeah. it's yeah. just, yeah. no, that's all right. My two, well, three closing questions for each of you, and either one of you can begin. Uh, the first question is because this show is called making it, what does making it mean to you? And also, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? I'll <laughs> just jump in. Making it for me is, I think when you are able to, you're able to have a life in the industry uh, that you really enjoy. 
you know, and that you've earned the respect of your fellow uh, peers, you know, that to me is making it. Um, and the three tips three, for success that have driven your career. Um, hmm. I mean, show up, <laughs> just show up and show up ready to go, mm-hmm. you know, and I so often, and, and, and it really is a fear thing, I think for a lot of people, but show up ready to go, make big choices, you know, do the work, just do the work, show up on time. <laughs> I, uh, avoid procrastination if you can. And the, I think procrastination is a, a, a cousin to fear, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a little bit of a cousin to fear because you procrastinate because you're afraid because you're afraid you'll make an, you'll, you'll fail. Right. I, I heard something recently and they said, the sooner you make the mistake, the sooner you will learn. So make the mistakes. Yeah, mm-hmm. just make them jump big. In. Make big ones. You know yeah. what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Tom, yeah. uh, do you Go have ahead. more t- Two more tips. Uh, I, she said it too. I, I, I tell them. You know, with musicians, I say, don't smell. Uh, you know, <laughs> practice. Be prepared. Show up over prepared. Yeah. Really, you cannot prepare do enough. The Be, do the work, which is what she said. Mm-hmm. Uh, learn to play in the sandbox together well. Mm-hmm. And if, if, if you're that person who has a rough time with that, then at least learn to be gracious and quiet. Mm-hmm. You know, just be Boy, polite. Be polite. Kindness goes a long way. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and respectful. And then if you're younger, learn to respect those people who've been around a while too. I still do that with older musicians that have long resumes that, you know, I'll just, I have a great deal of respect for those people because of their longevity and they've been around and there's so much to learn from them. So I just say, have, have respect for your elders, so to speak in the business Mm -hmm. and listen, listen, they'll teach you things. Great. Literally in our last four to five minutes that we have left to do this, Mm -hmm. I'll ask my final question and I'll start with you, Tom, at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Oh, I would tell my younger self not to worry. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Because I, so many things happened to me when I was young that shouldn't have happened probably when I was that young. I just say, it's okay. You'll survive. You're, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, don't be afraid. But, but that's what I did. I, I wasn't afraid in, in many ways. And uh, yeah, don't worry. It'll be okay. Yeah. Beautiful. That's what I would say. And Linda? What would you tell your younger self if you could? Um, you got it. You got this. Just keep going. Yeah. There yeah. it is. There it is. Thank you both so much. This has been a joy to share your story and to spend some time with you. And we'll be posting some ways to find out more about Tom and Linda if you want to be in touch with them or hire them. Everybody's for hire right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll put up a link to the uh, the song that, that we just all did together as well. So oh, great. Uh, everybody stay safe. Vote. And Tom and Linda Griffin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate respect and love you both. Thank you. We love you. We love you right back. Thank you, Terry, Mm -hmm. so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate you. Stay safe. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wallman.